outcomes. I don't think I have a learning outcomes in any other uh, lecture I give, but anyway. So what you should hopefully learn from these lectures is how to make a knockout mouse using the classical homologous recombination method from um, embryonic stem cells, um, and then how you could go on to make conditional knockout mice. So this is where the knockout will be just in um, certain cell types. Um, how you could make uh, knock-ins, so where you, you knock in um, mutations into the genome, and how you could make humanized mice. So um, what that means is replacing a mouse gene with the human version of the gene. And then uh, another kind of uh, uh, a cheaper way of making a, a knockout mouse is using gene trap embryonic stem cells, which I'll talk about. This is something we've done as well in the lab. And then um, finally, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, how you can change genes um, at the genome level in, in cell lines and in mice. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, so first lecture, number five. Okay, so, um, so this will have um, start off with some of the research we've done, which has led to making a knockout mouse. Uh, and we'll show, I'll show you some of the data from that and then exactly how the mouse was made and how we could make additional models. So um, because this is a, a platelet story, I'll just get you all up to speed on platelets. Have you, have you, any, have you guys heard me talk about platelets before? So you have. And you, yeah, okay, but, but Katie will be all fascinating and new to you, but boring for you guys. And it's all new to you guys as well, isn't it? You've never heard me talk about platelets before, right? Okay, good. Okay, and then, so they're, they're good side in health and they're uh, dark side in causing disease, heart attack and stroke. And then how we've identified this potential new drug target called CD148, and then how we've used gene knockout mice to, to study this. Okay. Oh yeah. So, um, so did I? Did I use this picture? In do you remember who it is? You do. <laughs> I want to. What am I talking about? You've got the. You've got the. Um, the thing on canvas, haven't you? So, what? What is the point of me asking you this question? Did anyone know who this was before I? Before you looked at the handouts. Um, so, so this guy. Um, he's. Um, I knew him as a Grand Prix racing driver. Um, Alex Zanardi, and he went on to lose his legs, unfortunately, but you can see here he's very happy. He, he got a gold medal in the London Paralympics, and this is the fancy uh, bike, bicycle he, he rides. So um, he had this um, horrific crash. So this was, he, he'd stopped doing um, the Grand Prix and moved to the IndyCar racing, which is the American version of, of Grand Prix, and he was leading the race and he'd gone into the pits to change tyres or whatever he was doing there, and then he came out very fast and tried to maintain the lead and had this collision with another car, so this is him going, going airborne here. So a horrific crash at 200 miles an hour, um, he lost four litres of blood, lost both his legs, but amazingly survived to drive again and to go on and, and become a Paralympic gold medalist. And it's a large part due to the efficiency of his platelet and clotting system that prevented him from completely losing all of his blood as a result of these horrific injuries. And also, it was very useful that this... Sorry, yeah. I think we have six, don't we? Yeah, I've got six. I measured it. <laughs> Did, did you see? Did any of you see the? I'm going off on a tangent now, but the um, the documentary about the the doctors working in the QE hospital. There were three yeah, docu. So did you see how they for that one patient they had to drain all the blood out of him? Because they had to repair the vessel, one of the vessels leading to the heart, because he had a tumor growing in the vessel. And, it and the, yeah. They, they chill it, they chill him. They go, was it 18 degrees centigrade they chill him down to? And apparently he's got 30 minutes at that temperature. If they go longer than 30 minutes, there'll be problems like brain damage. But they gradually cool him and they take the blood out. I was talking to a guy I know who works in that sort of area and he said, oh yeah, we do that all the time. He said they made, made it look amazing in, on the TV programme, but they, it's quite common to take people's blood out. 
So yeah, I tried it at home, uh, six litres yeah, for me. No, I, yeah, I, I guess it's around about that. But yeah, it's a lot, a lot of blood he lost. And, and also this guy who wrote the book, um, um, Stephen Olvey, was the first doctor on the scene who, who helped him out. Um, but yeah, the key, the key point is it's, we've got this fantastic uh, platelet and clotting system, um, and, and that's a cell type that I one of the cell types I work on. So I call them the humble platelet. Uh, they're small cells with uh, no nucleus. Uh, so here we have a platelet in the middle next to a much larger red blood cell and a white blood cell. So this is an electron microscopy image. So they only live about 10 days in the blood, these cells. Uh, but we do have a lot of them. So between 150 and 400 million per mil of blood. And because they have this limited lifespan and because there are so many of them, we have to produce this phenomenal number. So, so 100,000 million um, platelets produced every day to maintain the numbers. And these come from these large cells called megakaryocytes in, in the bone marrow. And platelets can be regarded as the first aid kit of uh, the bloodstream. So they, um, they prevent us losing too much blood by plugging wounds that we might get in our, our blood vessels. So um, I've drawn this simple scheme of how they function um, just to get you all up to speed. So we've got um, an endothelial cell. So we've got a blood vessel lined by these endothelial cells. So endothelial cells line all the blood vessels in the body. And I haven't drawn on the red cells because there are 10 times more red cells than platelets and it would make make it too busy, but the red cells would be tending to go up the middle of the vessel, they're larger, and they push the smaller platelets to the outside, uh, so the platelets are kind of tumbling along the edge of the vessel. And that's just where you want them, because you want them continually monitoring for signs of damage. And when we get damage due to an injury, um, the platelets are immediately activated when they see these uh, subendothelial matrix proteins like collagen or laminin that are now exposed to the blood. So the platelets have a whole range of receptors um, that bind to these proteins and then trigger activation of the platelet. And when the platelets are activated, they become sticky, their um, integrins are activated, and they're able to form these um, aggregates, uh, um, also called a platelet clot or a, a thrombus, and very quickly plug the site of damage and prevent too much blood from being lost. So that's the, the good side of platelets. We couldn't live without them, um, but they will end up killing almost half of us, and this is uh, through heart attack or, or through stroke. So, yes, a quick, a quick little um, intro or reminder on their role in um, heart attack and stroke. So, um, I might just turn the lights down for this one. Yeah, so we've, we've all, unfortunately, got... Um, this disease called atherosclerosis going on in our arteries. Um, so it's not really quite clear how this disease starts, but it's been seen in newborn babies and is a, a consequence of our Western lifestyle, our high-fat diet, lack of exercise, smoking, too much alcohol, all those good things we like to do. Um, and so for some reason we get uh, fatty deposits um, under our endothelial cells in these blood vessels in the form of um, cholesterol, particularly the LDL or low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. That's the, the bad cholesterol, if you like. And um, immune cells such as these green macrophages will tend to come into this region and they'll try to clear up the problem by gobbling up the, the cholesterol. And, and sometimes that works, and, and this initial fatty streak, as they call it, can resolve. But often um, it doesn't resolve, and the problem gets worse, and we get um, an inflammatory reaction occurring underneath the endothelial cells lining uh, these blood vessels. So we're starting to get smooth muscle cells proliferating. We're getting many more immune cells, so more of these macrophages, and we'll get T cells coming in as well. 
Um, the macrophages become these very angry uh, foam cells. They become laden with lipids and very inflammatory. They really drive an inflammatory reaction. And we start to get uh, uh, lots of cholesterol. Uh, we get um, lots of smooth muscle cells forming a kind of fibrous cap. And we start to get narrowing of, um, of the artery. And for many years, we, we don't know this is happening, but maybe when we're really old, we'll run up the stairs and suddenly we'll get chest pains. And that, that's a sign that not enough blood is getting to the heart because we're, we've got these, these narrow vessels supplying the heart. Um, and um, ultimately what can happen um, is we can get rupture of one of those atherosclerotic plaques and that's, that can be the catastrophic event. So, so here's a, a, a picture of a, a heart and here's one of the coronary arteries. And this is what a normal coronary artery should look like. No disease, but unfortunately, as I said, uh, some of our coronary, coronary arteries are starting to look like this, where they're narrowing due to this buildup of cholesterol and, and, and inflammatory cells. And if this uh, is to rupture this region, and the rupture will tend to happen when there's a lot of apoptosis going on, a lot of cells dying um, because of this very nasty inflammatory uh, environment, then the platelets will come along and they'll think, um, this is a wound, we've got to heal it, we can't let um, this person bleed to death but quite often the platelets will completely block blood flow through the vessel. And when you um, lose um, blood supply to part of the heart for more than about three minutes, that heart tissue dies. And when part of the heart dies, the whole heart tends to stop beating and that's um, a heart attack. And um, a very similar disease uh, can happen uh, to affect the brain as well. So here we have one of the main vessels supplying the brain with blood. And again, we've got this uh, buildup of atherosclerosis. And when we get a rupture, the platelets can aggregate and completely block blood flow. Uh, part of the brain uh, will die as a result of this loss of blood supply. And, and that will give the characteristic symptoms of stroke where, where often it doesn't kill the person but they might lose function in that part of the body that, that's controlled by this part of the brain. And I've heard, heard some clinicians say that stroke should really be called brain attack because it's much the same disease in the brain that I've just talked about uh, in the heart causing heart attack. So um, it kind of vies with cancer as being the most common cause of death. So it's... Um, you know, pretty severe stats, but someone has a heart attack in this country every two minutes. So a third of those never make it to hospital and half are dead within a month. Stroke isn't quite so prevalent, but still every five minutes someone has a stroke and it's actually the major cause of disability. So there's a real need to um, get a better handle on, on these diseases. And in, in terms of therapy, um, it's really aspirin is, is the kind of tried and trusted antiplatelet drug that uh, people will be on for the rest of their lives if, they're, um, if they've had a heart attack and survived it or if they're at risk of a heart attack. And, and um, I've drawn these scales here because it's, it's a balance. You don't want to completely inhibit the platelets because then you could have severe problems with bleeding if you injure yourself or you could even get spontaneous bleeding. Uh, but we want to inhibit the platelets enough such that they don't give us a heart attack. Um, and so there's a lot of money going into research uh, to find new, new drug targets that can kind of re-educate a platelet, um, allow it to do its normal wound healing type of role that stop it from causing a heart attack or a stroke. So that's the kind of big goal of platelet research and the reason why funding bodies like the British Heart Foundation are giving money to me and other people to try and um, understand this, uh, this disease more and, and find ways of uh, more cleverly um, inhibiting platelets because the problem with aspirin, people do suffer bleeds when they're on aspirin. Um, it's quite a strong platelet in inhibitor. And for some people, aspirin just doesn't work for, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. 
Okay, so I'll now come to this research uh, we've been doing or have done, and it will get to, to knock out mice, as you'll see. Um, for studying platelets, we really do need to use uh, knockout mice. So this was the hypothesis that we started with, and it was probably back in the late, um, well, around about 2007 we started this work. So the, the hypothesis was if we identified new receptors on the platelet surface that hadn't been discovered before, maybe some of these could be uh, exciting new drug targets to treat uh, heart attack or stroke. So how did we do this then? Well, um, Platelets are nice to work with in a way because it's very easy to get hold of them, so we just bleed each other in the lab. So by taking uh, 50 mils of blood from each other with a couple of centrifugation spins, we can get loads of platelets to, to work on. And of course, they're, you know, they're primary cells, they're real human cells. They don't suffer from the drawbacks of studying uh, tumour cell lines, uh, which, which um, tend not to properly mimic uh, what the real cells are doing in the body. In, in the body. So we can um, purify lots of uh, human platelets. And then what we did was to um, isolate the membrane proteins um, and to run them on um, uh, a protein gel, so by electrophoresis. And we can stain this gel up with a blue stain to detect all of the proteins as these blue bands. Um, and so it's the, the smaller proteins that are running faster through the, through the gel and the larger proteins at the top of the gel. We could then uh, cut out uh, the entire lane um, in little pieces of gel, and we can feed this into a mass spectrometer to identify uh, which proteins we've purified um, in, in the platelet membranes. So this is a mass spectrometer. I'm not an expert in mass spectrometry, but luckily this is something that bioscience is, is particularly strong in. We've got some good mass spectrometers and good people that run them, so you can give the sample to them and they'll tell you uh, what the protein was that, uh, or what the proteins were that were in that sample. So my very simple understanding of how this works is that you, um, you digest your proteins up into peptides, you then uh, fire them through this mass spectrometer where they get ionized, um, so they're, they're, they're electrically charged. And depending on their charge and their mass, they will be deflected through the mass spectrometer and will hit the detecting screen at a particular point. So you get mass and charge information on every peptide fragment. And based on that mass and charge, um, computer algorithms can figure out what that peptide sequence is. And you can then use that peptide sequence to figure out what the protein was that, that generated that. The, uh, what the peptide is that, uh, or what the protein sequence was that generated that peptide. So we did this and we found um, a total of 136 uh, cell surface proteins on, on platelets. And many of these were proteins that no one had identified on, on platelets before, so were potentially exciting, and we, we published this back in 2007. So this I did while I was still up in the, the medical school as a researcher there. And one of the most interesting that caught our eye was this prote protein called CD148. So CD148 is a transmembrane protein, as, as many of these proteins were that we found. Um, it's got a series of uh, repeats that make up its extracellular part, so sticking out, um, out of the cell. These little uh, blobs that I've drawn are all the sites of um, N-glycosylation, so it's heavily uh, decorated with carbohydrate as well as having these, uh, these repeats of, of, of protein domains. But most interestingly of all, it had um, a phosphatase domain uh, in the intracellular part. And this uh, particular phosphatase domain was known to be involved in activation of other cell types that had been studied, like B cells and T cells. But no one had reali realized up to this point that this CD148 protein was actually expressed on, on platelets. So we thought we'd take a look to see what it was doing on platelets. Could it be a new drug target uh, for inhibiting platelets? So how do we do this? 
Well, um, I often say to students, the best way to study uh, a gene is to knock out its expression and then take a look to see uh, how impaired the cell is as a result of losing this particular protein. So we'll just knock out the, the protein from human platelets and ask how impaired are they in various assays. The problem is we just can't do it. It's, it's impossible to uh, remove a gene uh, from a human platelet. Um, if you remember, these are cells that have no nucleus, uh, and they only live for about 10 days. We just, just don't have the technology for genetically engineering a human platelet and removing expression of a particular uh, gene. And this is where the poor mouse comes in, because, of course, we can do this in mice. If we make uh, a CD148 knockout mouse, all the cells in the mouse will be lacking CD148, and we can then purify the platelets from the mouse and, and ask the question, um, are these platelets impaired in their activation, and also do experiments in vivo with the mouse itself. So we try not to use mice if we can avoid it, but as you can see from this kind of rationale, uh, we really have to use mice to, to answer this question. And of course, we, we treat them humanely and we try to use as, as small a number as, as possible. So this is where we now digress into the actual um, um, history of reverse genetics in mice and how we figured out how to make uh, knockouts. So, um, so reverse genetics, so this, this is, as you probably know, it starts with a genetic modification and then you analyse the phenotype. And that's exactly what we want to do with CD148, knock it out and then ask what is the phenotype of the resulting platelets that, that lack expression of CD148. So some of the big developments, uh, in 1981, uh, scientists figured out how to make transgenic mice. So these are mice in which a foreign gene has been inserted into the genome. Um, in 1987, we discovered how to make gene knockout mice. And then in 1993, we figured out how to make conditional knockout mice where the knockout is restricted to certain cell types. And so I'll go through each of these uh, in turn. Okay. So the, the, um, the transgenic mice um, came from uh, the Palmiter group, as you might imagine. They published this in, in Cell, a kind of premier journal for this sort of um, research. And they showed how to get expression of uh, a foreign gene, which happened to be from um, herpes virus, so thymidine kinase, how to get that expressed in the mouse genome. And so the way they did this was they took uh, a, a newly fertilized egg from a mouse. So here you've got the, uh, the male and the female pronuclei. They then, um, with a use of a holding pipette, they micro-injected uh, DNA uh, expressing this thymidine kinase uh, gene um, into the male pronucleus. They then took this um, fertilized egg uh, and transferred it to a pseudo-pregnant female, so, and this then gave rise to, to little mice offspring, uh, which they could now show were transgenic. So what had happened was this DNA they'd injected uh, had become incorporated into the genome of the mouse, uh, and the mouse was now expressing this um, thymidine kinase. So, so a massive breakthrough. Uh, yeah? What's a pseudo-pregnant female? Um... Yes, good question. It's one of those words I throw about without, and I've never deeply thought about it. I think they must inject it with the sort of hormones that would mimic pregnancy. So obviously the mouse isn't pregnant, but you want it to think it's pregnant. So I guess they progesterone, estrogen, that sort of thing. I'm, I'm not an expert in reproductive biology. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So this is not, yeah, this is not the real mother. Of the, the not, it's not the biological mother. But yeah, good, good question. I guess you could, I bet if you look it up, it'll be, it'll be a... Have we got any reproductive biologists here? Anyone take a guess? No, it'll be progesterone or estrogen. I forget which, is, which one would be uh, most active at that stage. Um, so, okay, so on to, on to these uh, three happy guys. So they've just won the Nobel Prize, so they're particularly happy. So we've got um, Oliver Smithies and uh, Martin Evans. So they're, they're Brits. 
although Oliver Smith is, did his work in America, Martin Evans did his work in Cambridge, and then we've got Mario Capecci, an Italian guy, he, he also did his work in America. And so these, uh, these guys got their Nobel Prize because they figured out how to do homologous recombination um, in embryonic stem cells, and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. So some groundbreaking papers, again, as you can imagine, in the top journals, Nature and Cell. So um, I, I, I guess the, dis the discoveries of Smithies and Capecci were really helped by Sir Martin Evans's work. So Sir Martin Evans was the guy who really figured out uh, that you could... Uh, take embryonic stem cells from mouse embryos and that you could then uh, use those in gene targeting experiments. And the Smithies and the Capecci group were both kind of doing the same sorts of experiments. They were showing that you could do um, mutagenesis uh, in the genome of these embryonic stem cells and you could then generate uh, an actual um, whole mouse from one of these embryonic stem cells. So this big breakthrough allowing us to genetically modify these stem cells and then create a mouse from it. Okay, and this is, these next two slides essentially show you how you can do this. So I'll, I'll go through this slowly because it's, it's rather complicated stuff, but do, do stop me if you have any questions. So um, it starts with the gene targeting of the stem cells themselves. So where do the stem cells come from? Well, they come, as the name implies, embryonic stem cells. They come from mouse embryos. So we take our embryo and we harvest the blastocysts from the, the center of the embryo. And these are the cells which can go on and uh, generate any cell type in the body. Um, so they're, they're pluripotent and, and that's why you can generate your new mouse from any one of these pluripotent stem cells. So we can uh, take them out and then we can grow them in culture and because they're stem cells, as well as being able to differentiate into any cell type, um, they can also grow indefinitely. So we can just keep these growing in culture. And now we want to genetically modify them. So the whole idea is to do something like a knockout mouse. So we want to inactivate one of the genes in their genome. So the way we do this is by introducing a targeting vector. So we're now on to, on to step two up here. So the targeting vector will have um, regions of flanking homologous DNA uh, identical to the gene we want to target. Okay? And that sequence of DNA will be broken up in the middle by this red sequence, which is a, a neomycin resistance cassette. So this will confer resistance to, to neomycin on any cell which has taken up um, this DNA. And we also have, um, so this is this HSVTK. This is a herpes simplex virus, thymidine kinase, and this is actually um, lethal to the cells. So if they express this, this little blue gene, they're going to die. Okay, so this is a, a negative selection cassette in blue. That's going to kill the cells. And the red is a positive selection that allows the cells to survive if you throw on neomycin, which would normally kill them. Okay? So we introduce... And, and this targeting construct um, can be fairly difficult to make. It, back in the day, it used to be very difficult to make. It might, make, might take months using some rather meticulous and complicated molecular biology. I mean, these days you can get huge chunks of DNA synthesized um, for a few hundred pounds, so it's, it's got much, much quicker um, to do. But anyway, you would find some way of introducing that DNA into your cells by uh, transfection. Uh, maybe you mix the DNA with a, a, a lipid reagent and that gets taken up by the cells. Um, or you could use a, a, a virus to get it into your cells. But however you do it, the idea is to get this uh, targeting vector into your embryonic stem cells. And um, not all of the cells will take this up. So you can see on this little dish uh, showing that, in this case, only one of the cells um, has, has taken up uh, the construct. But you can now um, select 
for those that have taken up the construct by giving neomycin. So neomycin will kill off all the cells that haven't taken up that construct and are not expressing that neomycin resistance cassette in red. Now, when the DNA gets taken up, one of two things can happen. The most common thing to happen is that the DNA will just randomly be incorporated somewhere in the genome. Okay? Um, I don't know exactly why that happens, but it, it just does. You know, you give, you give some DNA to cells, and, and in certain circumstances, those cells will incorporate that DNA into the genome. Now, if it just goes randomly into the genome, you'll have this entire uh, set of, this entire, um, set of um, genes that have gone in, so you'll have your, your neomycin resistance, but you'll also have this pale blue, uh, this negative selection gene that's going to kill the cell. And so actually that cell will die. Uh, it'll survive the neomycin, but because it's expressing this herpes simplex virus, thymidine kinase, um, the cell will die. The only way the cell can survive the double selection is if you have homologous recombination taking place. So this is where the um, targeting vector actually finds uh, the gene that it's homologous to. So it finds the homologous regions uh, of the DNA in the targeting vector, vector and it homologously recombines down here uh, and is inserted um, into the gene. And because your negative selection marker in pale blue here lies outside of the homology arms, that won't be incorporated. Okay, so during the homologous recombination, it'll be just the flanking sequences and the neomycin that, re that replace the endogenous gene. So it's a rare event, but if you start with enough ES cells, you will hopefully capture this rare event where you get a cell that's undergone homologous recombination um, it has neomycin resistance, so it survives the neomycin treatment. It no longer has the, uh, the thymidine kinase, which would kill it, and so it survives. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Um, do you need to treat the cells to uh, with some cytotoxic agent for the thymidine kinase? Possibly. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, that, I... I can't remember. So th this is where you could have some outside reading possibilities. If, if you read up on this and find out the exact mechanism, I should look that up, for, for, certainly for next year's lecture. Uh, but yeah, look it up and, um, and find out, because actually, to be honest, I can't remember how the negative selection works. Um, thymidine kinase, it must be phosphorylating thymidines, but whether you have to add anything else to activate that in some way. You, you think you do? If yeah. It's incorporated and then kills the cell because that yeah. Yeah, I can believe it. Yeah, yeah. I look it up. What, what I have heard from talking to experts who, because I've never actually made my own knockout, I've kind of had them made by other people uh, or collaborated with people. A lot of people say it just doesn't work very efficiently, and, and they they just don't bother with it. Um, but certainly in this kind of textbook version of how you do it. Um, it's got, it's got this cassette. Um, so if it, if, it hasn't, if it hasn't worked properly, you find out at the screening stage when you start to figure out whether you have got it a proper homologous recombination event. Um, you figure out when you screen this region by PCR or sequencing, you'd figure out that something has gone wrong if it hasn't worked. But the hope is now that you can expand um, your embryonic stem cells and you can clone them out and, and analyze them and select cells where you've got this perfect targeting event where you've replaced just one allele, remember, so you're not replacing both alleles. That would be impossible. It, Probability-wise, you would never target both because it's, it's a rare event, so you're only going to get one of the alleles targeted. But one of the alleles would now have this neomycin resistance set in. So everyone else happy with that at the moment? Yeah, okay. 
So that, then what you do, you, you, um, so you clone out your embryonic stem cells, you screen them by PCR and, uh, and by sequencing through that, that region that you've modified just to make sure it's exactly what you want. You've got that neomycin cassette. And so this will be now interrupting that particular gene. So it will be a non-functional gene because you've got this neomycin cassette that interrupts the normal, um, the normal sequence of, of that gene. So you take your, um, your embryonic stem cells and you inject them into a blastocyst. Okay, so here's a, a blastocyst taken from a, a pregnant mouse and... Um, um, sorry, not a blastocyst, a, a, a fertilised um, egg or growing embryo uh, with a bunch of, of blastocysts there in the, in the centre and you're injecting your embryonic stem cell um, into this fertilised egg. Uh, and so what you hope is that your embryonic stem cells will um, snuggle up with the blastocysts and will um, start to proliferate and will now contribute to, um, to this developing mouse. So some of the cells in the developing mouse, when you put this um, uh, back into a, a pseudo-pregnant mother, uh, some of the, the cells in the, in the adult mouse that develops will come from your embryonic stem cells and some will come from the, um, from the embryonic stem cells in, within this blastocyst. Okay, so um, what you end up with are uh, mosaic mice, okay, because um, classically the way you do this is you um, use uh, coat colour uh, as a way of determining your level of, of chimerism, so the embryonic stem cell that you started with will have come from a mouse of one coat colour and your uh, blastocyst that you're injecting into will come from a mouse with a different coat colour. So you might have um, a, black, a black mouse and a white mouse and you're looking for mice that look like um, little zebras because they've got a contribution from both your um, embryonic stem cell and your... Um, and your blastocyst cells. So for some reason in this figure, they've got mice that are pink and yellow. I've never seen a pink mouse before. But anyway, if you imagine there could be pink mice, your embryonic stem cell came from a pink mouse, and uh, this blastocyst that you're implanting your embryonic stem cell into comes from a yellow mouse. And then you're hoping for a chimera that's as pink as possible because if it's a very pink chimera, it means that um, most of the cells will have come from this embryonic stem cell. If it's a very yellow chimera, it means that not many of the cells will have come uh, from your embryonic stem cell. Because what you really want is you want, uh, you want your embryonic stem cell to have contributed to the germline of the adult mouse, okay? Because... Um, what we end up then doing is we take a male mouse that's as chimeric as, as possible um, and we use that to breed with a normal uh, yellow female mouse um, and we hope that some of the sperm that come from the male mice will have originated from that genetically modified embryonic stem cell. So some of these um, sperm will uh, generate uh, mice in which you've got... Um, a copy of that gene knocked out by virtue of having that neomycin resistance cassette in it. And of course, some of the sperm will probably come from um, uh, the blastocyst cells in the um, original blastocyst, and they will just be normal um, yellow mice. You actually then need another round of breeding because all of these um, pink mice are going to have... Um, one mutated copy of the gene and one normal copy. So you've then got to breed them out uh, and genotype them to get pure homozygous knockout mice where both copies of the gene have that um, uh, mutation due to incorporation of the neomycin resistant gene. Does that, that make sense? Um, it's not a problem, believe it or not. So where, where the, the ethics come into it 
when you start to talk about degree of harm to the mouse and actual experiments. So j just the breeding, it, even though a lot of the mice are just going to be sacrificed because they might be normals and you don't want normals, that's not considered harmful because you're just, just killing them humanely. Um, where the ethics are really a problem is if you then said you wanted to take your mice and you wanted to test the effect of a drug and the drug is going to do harm to them and then suddenly, you know, all hell breaks loose. You've got to really quite rightly jump through lots of hoops and say how you're going to mitigate against harm on those mice because of that drug you're going to be giving them. You've got to start with a um, you know, low concentration of drug, um, use the smallest number of mice possible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that if you see any signs of distress in the mice, they're going to be sacrificed immediately so that they don't suffer, that sort of thing. But just breeding isn't classified as a, a severe um, event for ethics. Yeah. Oh, very good. Right, yes, I've heard of gancyclopia. Yeah, well done. Okay. But now it's not, it's not additional reading anymore because um, we've learned it in a lecture, so I can't give you your mark, sorry. No, I'm only joking. It's still additional reading, even though you did it during the lecture. No, very good. Okay. Okay, so people, people happy with that? Okay. Right, so, so back, back to our story. So, and this is where I had a bit of luck because when we did this work, uh, so round about 2008, 2009, uh, the lab I'd been before, uh, lab I'd been at before was in San Francisco. Um, and I knew, because I'd kept in touch with them, that they'd just made a CD148 knockout mouse in San Francisco. Uh, the very first knockout mouse for this gene. And the reason they were interested in it, in it was, was not because of platelets. They, they don't work on platelets. This was my old lab in San Francisco. They work on, on T cells and B cells. So they wanted to study this, my, this mouse to look at the T and B cells. But I knew they had it um, in the lab. And so I called them up and said, oh, could I come over, have a bit of a holiday in San Francisco, meet up with all my old lab mates, and can I take a look at the platelets in your, your knockout mice and see if they're, um, they're dysfunctional? And of, of course, they were only too pleased for me to go out there. I mean, um, they got quite a bit out of it as well as the collaborators and didn't have to do any work, just gave us a few mice and we would uh, bleed them and, and test the platelets. So it, it worked out quite nicely. I got a nice holiday in California and got to do a bit of experimenting on this particular mouse. Um, so the, the first, ex well, it wasn't actually the first experiment we did, but the first experiment I can show where I've got a video um, is um, testing how well platelets spread when you drop them onto an activating surface. So I'll show you what wild type platelets do first. Okay. So you see they drop down, and over a period of seconds, um, they send out these um, phylopodia-type processes, so they look like little starfish, and then gradually they fill in with lamellopodia, so the platelet looks more like a fried egg kind of stuck down um, onto the surface. And that's just what you want your platelet doing. I mean, if you'd, if you'd injured yourself, you want your platelets rapidly sticking to that site of injury and spreading out to, to plug the hole. So um, we then wanted to see, well, what happens to the knockout cells? So these are platelets without CD148. And you can see it's very different. So they seem a bit confused, these platelets. They're kind of poking out little phylopodia and then bringing them back. They're not really sure what they're doing. They're not, they're, not, um, they're not spreading properly, so they're very much impaired, I think. So this was, this was really exciting and for the first time suggested that this CD148 protein really was important for the, for the platelet function. I've never had laughter before, but that's, I like laughter. It's horrible. Oh, it's cute. Yeah, you like it? 
Yeah. I mean, this one seems to be giving the V signal, doesn't it? It's really a bit upset with the genetic modification we've given it. Yeah, okay. So you empathise with these platelets. You're not a CD148 knockout, are you, by any chance? No. <laughs> okay. So, so that's, that's rather artificial, just dropping a platelet onto a, an activating surface. Slightly more physiological is if we actually introduce flow into the system and we flow platelets over an activating surface and allow them to form aggregates. And, and now the, um, the platelets are much smaller in this uh, image, so each little dot represents a fluorescent platelet that we flowed over this activating surface. And this is what happens in the wild type. Um, this is what you want happening when you've got an injury. You want big aggregates of platelets uh, um, blocking um, any wound that you might have because they're binding to these subendothelial matrix proteins that wouldn't normally be exposed to the blood but are when you get injured. But of course, if you were having a heart attack, if, if you, one of your atherosclerotic plaques had ruptured, you wouldn't want this happening, okay? Because that could block blood flow. So we can have a look at our knockout, and it's quite different. So the platelets are certainly sticking, so there's a bit of rolling, but they're stopping. They, they seem to be kind of gently carpeting the uh, activating surface. They're not forming these big aggregates. So, so this was quite exciting, because we thought, well, if, if this happened when you were you had one of these atherosclerotic plaque ruptures, maybe you'd just gently carpet the rupture with platelets and you wouldn't lead to a complete blockage by having these big aggregates formed. So we started to think, um, you know, maybe we could be onto something, maybe this could be a, a, a good drug target to inhibit platelets but not completely um, inhibit their function. And, and finally, I guess the, the gold standard, and maybe this is where ethics comes more into it, but it, the gold standard is to actually do a, an in vivo experiment in a living mouse. So here um, we're imaging um, a blood vessel um, in the mouse, so here and here. And when I start the video, uh, we're going to fire a laser, which will hit the side of the vessel and damage it. Um, and then the platelets are fluorescent labelled in green, and you will see them forming um, an aggregate at the site of damage. So I'll play the, the wild type first. So you can see immediately we get vasoconstriction after the damage. So that's a normal response to injury to reduce the amount of blood going to the damaged area. And then we see this build-up of um, aggregate, aggregated platelets. They, they almost block flow, but they don't quite. And then over a period of um, minutes and seconds, um, you start to get this embolization away and, the, um, and the, the, the platelet aggregate becomes much smaller. But there's no sign of any blood loss here, so it looks like uh, these platelets have, have plugged the wound quite nicely. Okay, so let's go back. So if I now play them both together. So again, in the knockout, we get the same vasoconstriction response, but we don't see much happening. There's no real sign of any blood loss here, so something's happening, and then finally we see we've got a little platelet aggregate here, but it's much smaller, so these are defective platelets, but they're not completely defective. They're still able to form a little, a little plug that plugs that wound, um, and then it goes to a point where you can barely see uh, the platelets anymore. So we, we thought this is good, good evidence that we've found an interesting new uh, platelet protein and we've used knockout mice to show that the platelets in these mice are defective in function but not completely impaired. So just to summarise this then, we've used this proteomic mass spectrometry approach to identify this new protein on the platelet surface called CD148. And then we'd used these knockout mice that had been made by this group in San Francisco that I used to work in uh, to demonstrate the essential role of CD148 in platelet activation. And um, importantly, the mice seem perfectly happy, so they breed, they have normal looking lives, at least in the, the kind of cosy environment we keep the mice in. Um, 
uh, in the animal house, so no signs of any obvious bleeding problems, um, and yet in these kind of disease models, they're, they're clearly dysfunctional. And so this was our, our 15 minutes of fame, so the new scientist actually saw our paper and they had a little write-up on it, and um, they said, you know, CD148 is a realistic new drug target uh, for development. And, um, and I can remember, um, so it was my office mate, Yotis Senes, and I that did, actually did the work, and there were some senior people, more senior people on the paper as well. So Steve Watson, who has a big group up in the medical school, and Art Weiss was my former boss in San Francisco. And we said to them, oh, we should patent this. You know, we could, be, could be make millions out of this. It could be, you know, a new drug target. And they said, oh, I wouldn't bother. They said, you know, it'll... Um, what are the chances that, that you will actually get a drug that goes all the way through clinical trials? And, and, and so they really put us off. And then more recently we found out that other people weren't put, out, put off. So there's at least one big pharmaceutical in Germany who are actually now making inhibitors to CD148. And um, so really we, we should have put a patent on the idea, but we didn't. And now you know, any, anyone can work on this, but um, I guess that's okay. I could have been a millionaire, but um, I'm not. Um, so, um, oh, just a, a brief little bit then on how we think it's working. I mean, if you're really interested, you could read up on this. So, so Yotis Senis up in the medical school has really taken this further and done lots more work in this area. Turns out that this CD148 protein is pretty central to platelet activation. I mentioned it's a phosphatase, so it takes... Um, uh, phosphate groups off tyrosine residues, and it does this um, on kinases that control uh, important platelet receptors like these integrins, this GP6 platelet activating protein. Um, and without CD148, some of these uh, receptors just are not getting activated properly, and that appears to be the mechanism of action that this phosphatase domain uh, is helping to activate these other, these other proteins. Wow, it's three o'clock already. Um, do you want to take a break at this point? Yeah? I heard a big yes from someone. Y yeah, should we take a five-minute break and then resume? Okay. So if we're all back at... Um, if we go anywhere, if we're all back at... Hmm, five past on my watch, it says three o'clock at the moment, so five minutes... Oh, and these are just the acknowledgements of the people involved in that work and the British Heart Foundation who funded it. So, sorry? You never do. You never acknowledge yourself.